thank you for coming this afternoon. We printed nearly 200 programs, and I've just been told that we're out of programs. I apologize, but I'm also a bit delighted. My name is John Levine, and I'm from the College Writing Programs. And uh, I'm just so happy to see everyone here. Incidentally, today, I just found out last night, happens to be National Day on Writing. And it's, it's a complete coincidence, but it is, this was actually passed in Congress, National Day on Writing. I want to, first of all, just acknowledge um, some of the people who traveled from far and near, um, the many Tollefsons, Greg and Val and, and family, and uh, Steve's spouse, John Bunch, is here as well. So I wanted to tell you a little bit about how this event came to be. Um, those of you who know Steve well know that he didn't really go in for formal memorials. And so we were really challenged about how best to honor his memory. But one thing that he did was loved writers and writing and reciting and talking about writing. And to that point, that is why he started this series, Berkeley Writers at Work, in 1997, which incidentally is the year that I started teaching at UC Berkeley. And like my undergraduate students who can't imagine a world without the internet, I cannot imagine a world without Berkeley Writers at Work. So the way that we're gonna do this is we've invited some of Steve's biggest fans to come and read his work. And we th could think of no better way than to honor Steve's memory, but to listen to a small selection of the vast work, the, the vast writing that he did. But before we get to Steve's writing, uh, Bob Jacobson, Dean of Undergraduate Studies in the College of Letters and Science, we'd like to say a few words. You might be wondering why I'm up here. I'm not a writer. Uh, physicists just don't write. <laughs> but what little writing ability I have, I owe to Steve. He took me under his wing 17 years ago, roughly. And he did what he did for people across the campus. With generosity and with humor and with patience, he took me from being the campus's second worst writer to being its third worst writer. <laughs> and I owe him. So I'm very happy to introduce this. He never let me forget that writing is work. This is writers at work. It's something that you can do, you can get better at, and you can enjoy. And he always did it with a smile. So I thank you all for coming. I hope that we have smiles to remember his smile by. And I look forward to hearing every bit of the memories of Steve through his wonderful writing voice. Thank you very much. I'm, uh, I have the honor of reading three of Steve's somewhat early poems, and here we go. The first one is entitled, On Reaching the Summit of a Very High Mountain. There is no more except the sky, which seems a darker blue from here. There is no path the last half mile, and one must pick his way amid the rocks and snow as best he can. There is no more. The highest things are tiny blue forget-me-nots that huddle low between the rocks. Only the small or brave survive where wind and cold are dominant. The lake that hugs the mountain's base was lighter blue when I walked by. The pebbles now were boulders then. The summit loomed unthinkable. Now here I lie, there is no more. The second poem, um, with I think some Montana roots, is called Solomon City Mining Camp. You who were the glory of these mountains lie alone and empty, now beyond all hope. Once hope was God with greed when steel and will were feeling and intelligence. The mother load 
that drove your men to lead their golden lives became a vein of darker ore, the slag heap of their dreams. And now the flowers are returning, crowding in the empty doorways, fighting for the sun, and covering the feudal ground. And the final poem, Mammoth Hot Springs in Winter. Cold, scorches the lungs, burns fingers into an oblivion of feeling. Steam rips free from the hot sulfurous water, strikes the crystal air, and explodes into great white clouds with perfect silence. Hi, um, my name's Barbara Gross Davis, and I had the great joy of working with Steve for nearly 30, well, I won't say that, for a long time, <laughs> and, and delighting every day in his iconoclastic sense of humor, his uh, unbounded creativity, and his voluminous knowledge of just about everything. I will be reading a piece that Steve wrote about grammar. As you know, Steve authored several books on grammar. Grammar was very important to Steve, and he had a very firm philosophy of grammar. As he wrote in his Distinguished Teaching Award statement in 1984, grammar is the structure on which we hang our ideas. The piece I will be reading is called Grammar Rules That Never Existed or That Have Been Incorrectly Interpreted. It appeared in the inaugural issue of Writing Across Berkeley in spring 2000 and was the first in a series of columns by Steve on writing in general and grammar in particular. Grammar Rules That Never Existed by Steve Tollefson. You can't start a sentence with and or but. Of course you can, wrote Steve. You always could. And and but are coordinating conjunctions, and since they both coordinate and conjoin, they can begin a sentence. The trick, of course, is that it's got to be a sentence that flows from the previous one. Sentence fragments are never acceptable. Not true. <laughs> They're just pieces of sentences. Poorly used or thoughtless fragments are evil. Most good writers make use of fragments for rhetorical effect, and not just in fiction. Example, which public university ranks lowest in all areas? Certainly not Berkeley. <laughs> you must never split an infinitive. Berkeley's own Frederick Cruz English calls this an overrated taboo, and Berkeley's Robin Lakoff, linguistics, explains its source in our adoption of Latin grammar. In Latin, an infinitive is one word, so it can't be split. Most grammar types agree that sometimes the split infinitive sounds better than the alternative. Besides, you can't change Star Trek to boldly go where no one has gone before. <laughs> you must never end a sentence with a preposition. If it's truly a preposition, the rule has some validity. But most of those sentences don't end with prepositions, but end with fused, or two-word verbs. Then what we call a preposition is now known as an adverbial particle. <laughs> he threw up is just fine. <laughs> because the verb is through up, not through plus a preposition. <laughs> is this something with which you can put up? Ugh. The verb is to put up with. So why not just say, is this something you can put up with? It's fine. What follows a colon is always a list. No. It's always an explanation, expansion, or definition relating to what came before the colon. But it doesn't have to be a list. It can be one word or a completely independent clause. Note the colon in the last sentence. So hi, I'm Victoria Robinson. And um, about 10 years ago, Steve moved into the office where I was working. and. He brought a bear rug with him, yes, a rug made out of bear fur. And I knew then that I was in for a journey. 
Um, I think I was chosen to read this short essay that was in the Chronicle because I would often hug Steve in the morning before he'd gone to the gym and therefore not showered yet. And it was one of uh, our pet jokes. So this was published on April the 24th, 2011, and it's entitled Essay on Memorizing Poetry at the Gym. Stephen K. Tollefson, special to the Chronicle. So I'm sure I'm a big hit on the aerobics equipment at the gym. Almost everyone is hardwired into an iPod or fixated on the overhead television. A few on the bicycles are reading a newspaper or magazine. One in a hundred is reading a book. I, on the other hand, am clutching a wrinkled piece of paper partially wrapped around the handles of the rowing machine, looking at it intently when it gets close enough to read, and then moving my lips as it slides away. <laughs> Undoubtedly, people steer clear. But I'm just memorizing poems. I learned from my mother the joy of memorizing poems and wanted to see that passed on to the younger people who are not pressed to do it much more. So I teach a freshman seminar at Berkeley called Reading and Reciting Great Poems in English. The final exam consists of each student reciting 50 or so lines to the class. Cheat sheets are acceptable because this is not to be a pressure-filled situation. It's pizza, he loved to feed his students, and listening to people recite lines that usually they've chosen because those words have had an impact on them. The students never take the easy stuff. They memorize complex poems, free verse, blank verse, things that they don't always have nice rhymes with to help you get along. And they always do an amazing job. This year, I suddenly realized that while I do have a great store of poems memorized, I really was not setting a good example. I'd never taken the opportunity to memorize something new, to memorize along with my students. I picked the piece in our anthology that I love the most and decided to memorize it and recite it to the class. Edwin Arlington Robinson's narrative poem, Merlin. And it begins. When we parted, I told her I should see the king again, and having seen him might go back again to see her face once more, but I shall see no more the Lady Vivian. Let her love what man she may, no other love than mine, shall be an index of her memories. I fear no man who may come after me, and I see none. I see her still in green beside the fountain. I shall not go back. We pay for going back, and all we get is one more needless ounce of weary wisdom to bring away with us. If I come not, the Lady Vivian will remember me and say, I knew him when his heart was young, though I have lost him now. Time called him home, and that was as it was, for much is lost between Brusseland and Camelot. Pieces of lines stuck in my head after years of rereading, but not the section as a whole. At my age, memorizing was easier said than done, however. I started carrying a piece of paper with a stanza on it, pulling a piece of paper out in a meeting, and staring at it just as and staring at it is just as rude as pretending you're taking notes on your iPad, by the way. <laughs> and moving your lips in a meeting is something out of Dilbert. <laughs> then I realized that the rowing machine is the sort of answer. Uh, rowing is the most boring thing to do in the gym, since you really can't read a book that's constantly moving. So I printed the lines on 16-point type, wrapped the paper around the handles, and took off. 20 minutes on the machine used to seem like an eternity, now it flies by. I finished off the lines from Merlin in a week and stumbled through them on the last day of class. The students were kind, but I didn't give up. Every day I'd repeat the poem to myself while rowing, and then I added Archibald MacLeish's The End of the World. It went a little easier. Now I'm working on the last stanzas of The Love Song of J. Alfred Prufrock. Don't ask why the last one. Before I start working on a current poem, I spend the first minutes on the machine reciting the recently memorized ones. I used to worry about talking out loud while rowing, but in Berkeley, it's not that big a deal anyway. <laughs> and I'm always ready to offer an explanation if anyone asks, and I will sound so intellectual. I'm memorizing fancy poems, <laughs> not reading a sweaty copy of last July's People. One thing I had forgotten about memorization that's really a key 
You may have the poem firmly in your head, may be able to recite it silently to yourself, but it's a whole different set of synapses when you say it out loud. You've got to speak it to really learn it. In addition, I should have started with something easy, something with regular meter and a rhyme. I found the lines from Merlin extremely difficult. I want to start a trend. I never have. Jim should issue laminated copies of poems, <laughs> along with the towels. You don't have to pedal or row, although that's ideal because all that blood is coursing around and I'm sure some of it must go to the brain, I think. You also could memorize while well, stretching on the stair machine or the treadmill, even in the steam room or sauna. Steam room or sauna. Now gyms could issue t-shirts with poems on the back. That way, if there are several rows of bicycles, for instance, you could simply find someone with a good poem. Get on the bike behind that person. Of course, then we're talking about really short po poems, unless it's a very large person in front of you. <laughs> there could be designated sonnet areas and epic areas. Or if you don't feel like going to the gym, you could just start memorizing a poem tonight. Hi, um, I'm Oliver O'Reilly. I knew Steve since 1999, and uh, I spent a lot of time with him on the Committee on Teaching. And uh, he was just a wonderful guy. I think in a place where everybody wears their accomplishments, he wore them with such grace and modesty. He was just inspirational. So I feel very lucky to have come across him on my travels here, and very, very grateful to be here. Thank you. The story I'm going to read is The Greatest Name Ever. It was written in 2012 by Steve. You can't get away with a silly name for a character in fiction unless you're Dickens, who was, of course, the master of character names, and who gave us one of my favorites, the te teacher, Mr. Chalkham Child on In Hard Times. Naming characters is an art, although if you're not, if you browse the web, you'll see that it has become commodified. Lots of websites dedicated to telling you how to get just the right name for your characters, missing the point that the best names, of course, cannot be separated from the characters. Madame Bovary, Hamlet, Anna Karenina, Pip, Jay Gatsby, Atticus Finch. I tried the fictional character generator on the one site and got one good hit, Godfried Rodriguez. <laughs> he will have a complicated past, I suspect. <laughs> But wouldn't it have been better to write the past before the name? While most fictional characters have ordinary names, I always relish those names that stand in bold relief. Holly Golightly, Josarian, Humbert Humbert, Eustasia Vi, Queequeg. To me, these names sound wonderful, quite apart from the characters, but they are so clearly the names of characters, not people. On the other hand, I've noticed a trend in the naming of children. More and more of them are named as if they are fictional characters. <laughs> I do like names that are different. I've always liked the Bruce, Willis, Demi Moore girls. You know, Scout, Rumor, and the other one. <laughs> I like Dweezil well enough. Moon Unit, not so much. But I can't remain silent when I know that Bob Geldof, has a, uh, Bob Geldof has a daughter who I believe should have been a character on a comedy about prostitutes with hearts of gold, Fifi Trixie Bell. <laughs> of course, I'm avoiding discussion of the very great names for various James Bond female characters. At the risk of offending large numbers of people, I must admit that I've never cared for Tiffany or any of, their, of its variants because I'm old fashioned. I was brought up to believe that children should not be named for commercial establishments. I'm, not, not, I'm not also not fond of Brittany as a name for anything but the lovely area of France or the breed of dog, Brittany Spaniels. And I'm particularly unfond of variants that seem more like pa paternal misspellings. Brittany, no E, Tiffany with an I. Will there ever be any serious literary novel with any one of these names for their main character? Not in my lifetime, <laughs> I hope. By the way, one, 
One of Sylvester Stallone's sons has a phonetic name, perhaps the first I've ever seen, Sergio, with a H. I heap equal scorn on Dakota, Austin, and Shane. Shane is one of my all-time favorite Western novels, which is probably why I dislike hearing kids ha named that. They probably never heard of the book or the movie, and as for Dakota, of course, I always want to ask North or South, <laughs> capital Pierre or Bismarck, but I don't. They probably don't even know it's a state, just a cute name. But Pierre or Bismarck, now there's a couple of good names. A baby name website I found has a section on Shakespearean names, if you're so inclined. I can just see someone happening on Iago and thinking, what a name. <laughs> I tell you, don't name the kids other characters or places unless you've read Othello or grown up in Austin or owned land around Fargo. On the other hand, some of Shakespeare's names did appeal. Dogbury, from Much Ado About Nothing, has a certain insuance and seems appropriate for a little boy. And I'm rather fond of Dull, from Love's Labour's Lost. Gee, I don't know why. I do have a modest proposal to stave off the darkness we need to return to the greatest name ever, a name of dazzling character and substance, a name from the time when a name meant something, and it's the name of a fictional character. There has never been a name more redundant or of substance and meaning to me than Stupefying Jones of Lil Abner's comic strip fame, or more particularly, Stupefying Jones as she was represented by Julie Neymar in the 1959 movie version of Lil Abner. We have Julie Neymar to thank for the embodiment, but Al Cap to thank for the name. He can rest easy in his grave, just knowing that if nothing else, he gave the world that name. Al Cap was a master. Moonbeam McSwine, Senator Fogbound, Marrying Sam, and Appassionato von Climax. <laughs> Why a drag queen or a sister of perpetual indulgence in San Francisco hasn't appropriated the last one <laughs> is beyond me. But my heart belongs to stupefying Jones. She was, how shall I put it delicately, a bombshell, or more accurately, a secret weapon. All she had to do was show up, give her hips one good swirl, and men were frozen in place. She was, after all, stupefying Jones. She stupefied. I'm sure that some women would argue that they did, she didn't really have to go to all that trouble, <laughs> that we men are innately stupefied anyway. No comment. Um, please note that it is very important that you do, do, you do not pronounce the first part with a G as in stupefying. That's just wrong. And remember, it's a two-part name, not stupefying or Miss Jones, but stupefying Jones. So instead of going the Dakota, Brittany route, or as I like to call it, the Brittany route, let's return to names of great sig of significance. Gargling Stuart Rod, Glacial Stuart, Martha, Gimlet-eyed Stuart, John. This is a sort of like a return to names like Jack the Tailor or Babyface Taylor once more. Fun, and without machine guns. I would be enjoying the Republican debates much more right now if I was watching Wild and Crazy Perry, Party Poop and Paul, or, <laughs> or Vacillating Romney. My only consolation is that we are not watching Brittany Bachman, Dallas Perry, Austin Paul, Dakota Kane, and Shane Romney. That would be the end of civilization. <laughs> we really don't have much time. The darkness is gathering. Nicholas Cage named his son Kaiao Coppola Cage, which does raise the very serious question, what planet are you from? <laughs> Unfortunately, the name is Krypton. Greetings, everyone. Uh, my name is Flora McMartin, and um, I wanted to give you a little context for uh, how I know Steve. Um, mainly, I unfortunately or fortunately shared a desk with him about 25 years ago, and I guess some stuff rubbed off because sooner or later I did learn how to write. Um, more recently, though, I am a member of what I'm going to call the Milano Coffee Club. Um, every morning, in case you didn't know that, about 7.30, Steve and about 10 friends showed up um, to discuss important events of the day, 
do a lot of word play and punning, um, talk about the history of the Bay Area, talk about great hikes, and talk about all the wonderful wildflowers and waterfalls that he'd been seeing. So um, I think that's why I got uh, drafted to read what I'm going to read, and I have to say I was really delighted um, to do it because I was invited about two days after I returned from a camping trip. And I'm going to be reading something called Reading in the Dark with a Headlamp. <laughs> so in honor of Steve, I think it's important to have at least one person, you know, whatever. Um, Steve wrote this in February 2011, and it was published in the Chronicle. The other evening, I was reading an actual book on paper in bed when my bedside light started to flicker. It finally became so annoying that I took it off and pulled on my old camping headlamp. I used, to, for re, I used to re, I use it for reading in the summer at our cabin when the lights are out. It doesn't disturb those around you, shining its light just on the page in front of you. But by this time, I'd been reading for about a half an hour with regular light. And suddenly, in the dark, I was with just a circle of light on the page. The contrast was startling. I realized I was reading in a different way. Usually when reading, we may be concentrating on a line or a sentence, but somewhere in the back of our minds, we're also seeing the larger context, the whole paragraph, the page, and even the next page. We notice whether the paragraphs to come are long, whether we're at the end of the chapter. Sometimes our eyes wander from the sentence to look ahead, reading a few words or a sentence, and then returning to where we were. And there's more than just the verbal context. Without realizing it, we probably look up from time to time. We see the bedspread, the window shades, the cobwebs in the corner, the photograph on the wall. My primary visual memory of every one of my bedrooms from childhood through graduate school is from the vantage point of sitting in bed reading. I'm an avid reader but have never been one who can get so absorbed in a book that I'm not aware of the things going on around me. I call it Reading Attention Deficit Disorder, <laughs> R-A-D-D. If a lion chased an elephant in front of me and it was followed by a marching band playing the Stars and Stripes forever, I would surely look up at that. <laughs> but I know people who would never even notice it. The headlamp changed everything. There was nothing but that circle of light that didn't even cover the whole page. I had to move my head slightly or move the book. I was no longer reading in a context, but reading each line as it came into view. It was like some old movie, the detective in the dark house rummaging through the suspect's desk, his flashlight shining on old matchbooks, cigar butts, photos of the wife, until suddenly it settles on the will, the contract, or the old clipping. I was in the middle of a mystery, even though I wasn't reading one. I didn't know, couldn't see what was coming next. And because I couldn't see what was coming, I found myself paying more attention to what was there, to what was being said. Reading this may, way made an interesting book almost exciting, even though it certainly wasn't meant to be. I was reading in the dark. It was like peering through a microscope, seeing a little world that I might have otherwise missed. Words squiggled into view and out of view. Evelyn Wood would not approve of my method. <laughs> It's the antithesis of speed reading. Because it was surprisingly intimate, just a few words 18 inches from my nose, I thought of Wallace Stevens. The house was quiet and the world was calm. Certainly the best words about reading ever written. I love Emily Dickinson, but there is no frigate like a book, please. <laughs> Uh, even in this focused world with a single light shining on a few pages, that R-A-D-D -D managed to reassert itself. If I couldn't see the context on the page or the context of the bedroom, 
my mind could still wander. I reread Stephen's poem the next day, thinking that I had finally gotten it in a deep way. The reader became the book, and Summer Night was like the conscious being of the book. And the truth in a calm world in which there is no other meaning itself. But I was wrong. I wasn't there. The book and I and the truth were not the same thing. I was just the reader. It was just the book. Hi, I'm uh, Mike Larkin, one of Steve's colleagues from the College Writing Programs. And I uh, want to take this opportunity to direct your attention to the fine print inside the program. You'll see that our colleague uh, Jane Hammonds put together a compendium of as much of Steve's work as she could find online uh, for people to read. So if you want to revisit any of the stuff you heard tonight, the many of the things we can't read because we don't have time, or the rest of the story that I'm going to read you the beginning of, uh, you should check that out. And to further entice you, I should tell you that I've done an exhaustive survey of the literature, and I'm quite sure that this story that I'm going to read you is the only short story in the English language that features a sex scene in which the word praxis figures prominently. So I encourage you to check it out. Also, I was thinking of uh, who is going to be here, his family members, his loved ones, his husband, colleagues, students, friends, uh, people who've known him his whole life for just a few years. Uh, but I think the one thing that we all, no matter how well we knew Steve, that we all know about him, that if we could say he loved one thing above anything else, it would be attending academic conferences. I think we're right about that, right? So I say that as preface to this, because this short story, I think we can read as perfectly one-to-one -one autobiographical. I mean, he really should have written it as a personal essay. That's just my opinion. Anyway, this is Strunk and White Died for Our Sins. I'm off to MLA, Merle would announce every December 23rd. Although Christmas was coming, it was really a minor inconvenience to her a day that interrupted her preparations for the Modern Language Association conference. I'm off to the Four Seas, she'd explain in the spring. The mysteries of the Swallow's regular return to Capistrano is really nothing compared to Merle's spring migration to the Conference on College Com Composition and Communication. Really looking forward to NCTE this year, she said every year. The janitor in her building didn't know about the National Council of Teachers of English and thought that every year she went off to the NTSB the National Transportation and Safety Board. He thought she sorted through the wreckage of plane crashes. Merle didn't just love going to conferences, she loved thinking about them in advance. She studied the programs as if they were the Dead Sea Scrolls, at first handling them gently, gingerly, lovingly, until lust took over and she practically ripped them apart to get at their innards. She swooned over the list of pre-conference sessions, becoming nearly faint in a proper Victorian sort of way from overstimulation. She deeply appreciated that conferences had expanded and that there were now pre, during, and post-conference activities, meetings, colloquia, seminars, workshops, roundtables, working groups, committees, subcommittees, symposiums, task forces. <laughs> D-Day, the war in the Pacific. Neither was less complicated or more thoroughly strategized than Merle's attack on a conference. She studied the various hotel floor plans with all the care of patents studying maps of the coast of North Africa finally selecting the room that was just right, close to the action, but quiet, something with a view of the ocean or mountains or of a roller coaster she would never visit, and a writing desk. For this reason alone, she considered the internet to be one of the greatest boons to humanity. She was able to call up floor plans of nearly every hotel in the area, uh, sorry, of the area of the conference, print them out and plot, often with a protractor and sometimes a compass the route from room to session to lunch to session to break to session to dinner to late evening session. The descriptions of the keynote speaker and the plenary session gave her palpitations. But Merle was truly transported, as surely as if Captain Kirk had beamed her aboard, as surely as if her soul had learned astral projection by the pages and pages of concurrent sessions. Whenever a colleague would happen by her office, she'd call out through the open door, what do you think? I'd really like to attend this session called the textless pretext text and its relation to the post text. <laughs> but it's at the same time as watching the fur fly, Jane Austen's cat phobia is catalyst for her reliance on hidden puns. <laughs> I'm at my wit's end. 
The more gracious of her colleagues would spend a few minutes debating the pros and cons of the sessions. She'd thank them, and they'd take their leave. Often, when she called it out in this way, in flagrante delicto, it was the janitor who was standing there who would always reply, they all sound good to me. <laughs> like all true lovers, Merle loved conferences not just for what she could learn, that is, for their virtues and vices, but for the conferences themselves, for the entire gestalt of the idea of conference. Like a child who's not invited to many birthday parties or to sleepovers, when Merle found something she could go to, she grabbed it with gusto, and Merle went to conferences. Her return from any given conference was as triumphant as a ticker tape parade as she marched back to her office, her face flushed, and from the long, not from the long flight, but from the sheer glory of it all. Clarence Bosworth gave the best keynote speech I've ever heard. He talked about how we're not living up to our responsibility, not to our own students, but to the street children of Brazil. I think the best thing he said was that essay development cannot come at the expense of third world development. I tell you, it really made me think. Why bother with teaching sentence fragments? I think my whole life has been a sham. I think I'm going to revamp my course, make it more relevant, more interesting. And rethink and revamp he did with fervor and she, sorry, with fervor and regularity. See, autobiographical. Okay, with fervor and regularity. Once she overheard a colleague say that her courses had more makeovers than a week of Jenny Jones reruns. But she didn't take offense. Merle was a good teacher. She knew it and her colleagues knew it. She welcomed students whenever they stopped by, was even-handed when marking their papers, demanding but kind. She knew her way around a freshman essay and a freshman class. She was loved, not beloved, but loved nonetheless. She often thought of herself as Maggie Smith in the prime of Miss Jean Brody, but without the unfortunate fascist leanings. <laughs> Il Duce for her was still John Wayne. She always had the outlines from concurrent sessions she wasn't able to attend, her battle plan was to scurry from the coral room to the azure room to the oak, redwood, pine, fir, and maple rooms, swoop, scooping up materials as fast as she could before settling just a little late in the back of the hemlock room to listen to the panel on Huck's, Huck's Conversations with Jim, a new paradigm for engaging students in the discourse of academia. <laughs> Post-conference, Merle would sit in her office mumbling to herself, rummaging through stacks of papers. She would shout, aha! as if she were Sherlock Holmes and pull out of a piece of paper. This is what I want to try this term. I'd never thought of organizing students into teams to debate grammar issues. I think it'll make it more real for them. Don't you? Sometimes there was someone in the room when she asked the question, and sometimes there wasn't. But if the janitor was passing, he would nod in approval. For her vacations, Merle would seek out smaller off-season conferences and workshops. Vision Quest, students writing in and about the wilderness at Chateau Lake Louise in Canada. Ambassadors without portfolio, a critical re-examination of current trends in classroom portfolio use at the Disney World Hotel in Orlando. <laughs> writing around the edges, the importance of students' marginalia in understanding their writing process <laughs> at the Westin Kauai. Each new conference or workshop was like the beginning of a love affair. And then something happened. And if you didn't need a reason to read more of Steve's writing, um, that, that's reason enough. I want to thank all of our readers today. I want to thank the Morrison Room for, for the lovely space. I want to thank ETS for recording today's event. And I want to thank each of you for joining us today. Um, please stay around if you can. There's some wine and food, and we hope you'll stick around um, to uh, take part in some more informal conversation about Steve. There are also some books um, that you may have seen on the way in. If you want to write down some memories, we'd welcome that. So thank you again.